Hello everyone and welcome to another welcome to another podcast episode where we are investigating this topic and its complexities from every angle that we can think of. Now I'm not sure whether you saw the last podcast episode that I released but I reviewed a documentary that was at the very least hugely thought provoking and created an incredible conversation on my social media platforms. Now we've got the researcher that featured in that documentary here today, James Cantor, and we are very excited to explore his knowledge that he has been researching in this field. So James, thank you so much for agreeing to come onto my podcast. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted you had the guts to cover it. <laughs> Not many people do. Okay, so let's just start it there. Why is it that you say to me, you've got the guts to cover it. And why is it that I actually felt more nervous than usual having this conversation? Oh, I think there are three different answers. And by the time I start <laughs> the first, I'm not going to remember the others. Uh, part of it is uh, very natural. It's just an uncomfortable topic because you never know you know who was a victim of abuse you know the emotions run really really high and we're you know afraid of upsetting people uncomfortable you know it, it, it's uh that's what makes it uncomfortable to begin with uh part of it uh also is it's gotten worse in society i'll say in the past 10 years really since social media replaced actual media and actual social contact. Think, uh, when I started this research, people very quickly, oh yeah, if we could figure out, you know, what in the brain or what caused it or what happened in the womb, that's where prevention is gonna come from. You know, so, you know, although people had a discomfort with the idea, very, very quickly people, oh, mm -hmm. I get it now. Yeah, no, this is how we have to handle it. Then, you know, social media happened and it's changed society in a, things are not healthy. Mm. There's a, I mean, there was always a chunk in society worried about how things look. Now that's all there is. Everything mm. is image. Everything is, how is this going to look on my feed? What is this going to say about mm. me? And that's the end of the conversation. It's very difficult to have any conversation on any topic, never mind, you know, controversial ones, where people are too afraid of how something is going to make them look or can be used in order to make them look whatever way that we, we've slid. That it's, this was an easier conversation to have 10 years ago. Wow. So I think a part of it is, yeah, and it, as I say, it's not just this topic. It's sex in general and controversial topics in general. Everything has become, the public conversations have become so polarized that there is no conversation. It's just flag waving, telling everybody what side you're on, decrying the other side, and nothing that won't fit in a tweet. Do we still call them tweets? Uh, yeah. Nothing, you know, nobody can express an idea that takes an essay length of thought mm. to think about. Uh, so as I say, intellectual community, thoughtful community, hang on to your emotions and process this for a second. Society has lost something very, very important. And, you know, of course, because this is one of the most provocative topics, this was the can I say canary in the coal mine? This is one of the things that's actually become harder uh, to talk about in a productive kind of way. But actually, ultimately, these are the conversations we need to have in order to uh, uh, enact genuine, meaningful policies that will, you know, protect children. Okay. But when people don't want to hear the facts because they're afraid of how it's going to make them look, all the policies just end up getting based on myth mm, mm. and it's as I say it's making things worse okay and that saddens me to hear that it's getting worse I would have liked to have heard that it's actually getting better as we evolve these conversations and and the 
controversial um, side of it, or I'm, I'm just trying to think in my head, like, why is it controversial? Because actually the aim that we all want is for the crime to not happen in the first place. And so we can't seem to have a conversation about it because every time I pose this concept of aiming to stop the person from committing the crime in the first place and how are we going to do that? It's so emotive. I can't even believe it. But we're all here for the same mission and it just seems common sense that we would... And, and here's where I break down because I don't know what language to use. Either work with the person, help the person, support the person in some way. Just those that want it, right? Just those that want it. Then surely we would do that if it brought us closer to them never committing the crime in the first place. How is that controversial? That Surely that's common sense. Uh, it It should be. The part where people get caught is that we're treating them like people okay that's we're treating them as point. three it's if any word comes out of our mouths and it's not telling everybody how evil and rotten how the how we need to you know throw them into wood chippers it's a contest for who can express the greatest level of distaste disgust and hate wow. and if it's not expressing one's own essentially it's virtue signaling if it's not a sentence about virtue signaling, if it's trying to understand a person as three dimensions, oh, you're one of them, you're automatically suspect. Okay. Yeah, okay. So as I say, it's, it, it's the virtue signaling, it, it's the virtue signaling that, that has uh, stopped it and that, again, I'm going in a circle. That's what social media has done. That's okay. the only part that's, you know, sound bite filled enough it's the people who have the strongest emotions who will type the loudest, mm, type mm. the most often, mm. you know, with the least thought behind it. And so then it's, right, we're not having a conversation. A person is just spewing their emotions. And I have a certain sympathy for them too. As I say, some of these people are victims, you know, yes. so they, it's so for some people, you know, I'm, do I say lucky? You know, I was, I, mm have the fortune to be able to be a pure intellectual and think about this in an objective way. You know, my emotions are just, you know, regular emotions. I don't have, you know, stuff really of my own to work through in order to be able to put that aside and then continue having a conversation, uh, continue having a conversation. Understood. Uh, but so, it's the, uh, yeah, okay. So it's the, one of the reasons why this is so emotive, understandably so, is because lots of people that are, let's say my audience, lots of them have had an experience of child sexual abuse in their childhood. So to start talking about, um, again, for lack, lack of better words, supporting, helping, working with people before they offend is a trigger because as you said, and it's a great point that you make, It can't, if, if we're going to suggest doing that, it's kind of like we see them as people, we're humanizing them. And actually all we want to do as a reaction to what happened to us when we were children is put them in a box and call them evil and then be done with it. But that's not helping the next, that's not going to, let's take somebody who has never offended, no, sorry, who offended against you. That's not going to, but by putting them in a box and calling them evil, it's not going to work towards or increase the chances that they're not going to offend again. And if our if our aim is children and for this to not happen to more children, then putting everybody in a box and just calling them evil is not very productive. Am I right in saying that? Uh, yes, although we've skipped a step. Uh, the first step is to understand the situation, to understand them, to understand their motivations, to understand what's going on in their heads. And then, you know, if we do then find, and there do exist evil people, there do exist evil child molesters, and there isn't a lot we could do with them. Mm. Those are the psychopaths. Okay. And whether they offend against children, whether they're serial rapists against adults, you know, what it, there exist psychopaths. And we have no therapy, we have no intervention, we have no pill, we have no antidepressant. There isn't a lot we can do with those people except to uh, 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 to box them, take them out of circulation. Such okay. people exist. Okay. Uh, 
But the way things run now, you know, it's the most heinous cases that hit the papers that get talked about a lot. You know, pedophile, you know, finishes work, goes home, you know, has a glass of wine. That doesn't make the papers. Mm -hmm. We only see the bad cases. And the badder the case, the more we see it. So right. it's really slanted, you know, the proportions and how we're allocating our attention and resources. The people who, you know, the, the basis of my and now other researchers work is that nobody asks to be into whatever it is they're into. Right. Never mind gay straight, but, you know, we don't ask, you know, to be into whatever age range we're into. The evidence shows that they, you know, they inherit isn't the right word, but they were born into it. They don't want it. They would rather, mostly, they would rather be able to have a regular everyday boyfriend, girlfriend, regular everyday relationships. Right. But it's trying to change that essentially is conversion therapy. It doesn't work. Mm. You know, it's been tried. Uh, now and then there's the occasional therapist who gets fooled into thinking that uh, the therapy was successful, but no objective, uh, 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 no objective assessment has said that it uh, that it does anything. Uh, so the best we so we're left with. All right, what do we do? Mm. It's one thing when the person is actually a criminal and has actually offended against somebody. Yes. But then we have the ones who just you know, regular everyday person, ten, eleven, twelve. When the the person was ten, eleven, twelve. You know, and getting crush on other 10, 11, 12 year olds are perfectly normal. But then they start hitting 16, 17, 18, and they still get their crushes wow. and attractions to 10, 11 year olds. And that's when they, oops, I got a problem. Mm. So they only figure it out later in life. And then, all right, now what? Mm. The, I mean, never mind being gay I and mean, that being a secret until a person's ready to, uh, to talk about it. This one is, and with a lot of mandatory reporting laws, depending on the jurisdiction somebody is in, they can't even tell a therapist. Wow. They're afraid that the therapist will be required to report them. They haven't done anything wrong. All mm. they want is the support for it. And sometimes it could be just talk therapy. For some people, it's sex drive reducing medications. Wow. We want them to come in. We get people in asking for chemical castration, but they can't do that if they're afraid of getting reported. So mm. it's this, you know, I understand the motivation for, oh, these people need to be reported so we can follow them. Or, you know, people think that that's protecting society, but it's mm. making it worse. They get, uh, uh, all it really does is just drive these people underground. Mm. And underground is where the trouble is. We're just, you know, we feel better because we, you know, shoot it out of our vision. But that's where the abuse happens is outside of our vision. Mm. We want people to be able to be where we can see them, supervise them when necessary, get them the therapy when, uh, when necessary, provide, you know, every alternative uh, we can think of, but you know, humans are still humans. And uh, these days, especially things are getting run out of people's emotions and feelings of disgust. Mm, wow. James. Oh my goodness. Um, can you um, give us a brief um, uh, explanation of uh, your work or your career, please? Or your Ooh. credentials, <laughs> just, just anything like that. Because usually I start this podcast with, please introduce yourself, yep. but we went straight into the conversation. Sure. So for anybody that's listening, that's like, well, this is fascinating, but who is this guy? Please. Um, yep. uh, my name again is James Cantor. And, you know, ultimately I'm a sex researcher. Uh, and the kind of sex research I do is what makes people into whatever it is that uh, that they're into. Uh, my background is in psychology. I'm a clinical psychologist and neuroscientist. It was just really by accident that, you know, I ended up with a foot in both of those camps, but I've ended up, you know, with an opportunity really to, uh, to use them. Uh, my plan just being, a, you know, again, going back, you know, 30 years ago, starting school, my plan was to be a regular everyday gay psychotherapist, you know, helping, you know, other people just go through, you know, gay life often needing the, uh, the extra support. Uh, and so I, uh, the last year of one's internship is uh, uh, 
uh, is uh, at the last year of a PhD program is an internship. And there are very few sex related internships, you know, to become a sex therapist. Uh, but one of the places here in Canada, a very famous one at the time, uh, was the Clark Institute of Psychiatry. They had a, a, a gender clinic for people with gender dysphoria. So, ah, okay, that close enough that that'll work. But that's half my half of one's internship. I needed an other half. There was also a sex offender clinic. Yeah, all right, not what I was thinking, not what I expected. Never thought about it, but it makes a reasonable other half. All right, so started doing therapy, learning about these people, and they, that lab, was already planning to do some research on what in the brain might be related to pedophilia, analogous to the research that was going on in the 90s, you know, is gay, you know, nature, nurture. Mm. All right, so we were getting the data saying, nature, well, what about this other, you know, okay. again, not to put them in the same camp, but the same scientifically it's the same question nature or nurture mm. but i came in with an interest and background in right both the psychology of it and in sex therapy but i also had a background in neuroscience mm. so i was just in the right place at the right time to be able to do the kind of testing and the kind of analyses that uh, that the institution wanted and uh the first set of studies I just I, Stunned. I really not what the, uh, what we were expecting. The first thing that we got uh, found, slightly lower IQ. That could mean anything. Lots of people who commit offenses uh, uh, have a lower than uh, uh, than average IQ. But handedness. Regular every day, the mainstream population, roughly ten percent ish, are non right handed. So far as brain organization is concerned, ambidextrousness goes with a, a left handed uh, left handedness. So we say right-handed and non-right-handed. Okay. But it was like 35% of the pedophiles. Okay. Well, that's not, I could understand that the lower IQ pedophiles were more likely to get caught. So that's why we were finding low IQ, lower IQs a little bit on average. Not, you know, it's not like they're all, you know, really subnormal IQs, just numerically a statistical difference. But handedness? And a level of handedness difference, you know, more than three times what it should be. Mm. That, right, that that doesn't seem left-handed is more likely to get caught. That that didn't seem right. Right. But it was a smoking gun because there's only one and only one thing that determines handedness. Brain organization, okay. hemispheric dominance. You know, right hemisphere dominant is left-handed. Right, left hemisphere dominant is uh, is right-handed. Of course, for a long time, there was a bias, you know, kids, uh, uh, generations before mine were, you know, forced to write with their right hands. But that this is in the opposite direction. I'm finding an excess of okay. left handed. So I get this had to be in the brain. The only explanation was that this was in the brain mm. and the relevant parts of brain development were before birth. So it wasn't learning. It wasn't something that happened during life. You know, mm. this is end of first trimester of development is essentially a, 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 when it happens. So that was, as I say, the smoking gun, mm. nothing directly relevant, but okay, this is brain. Mm. And so it was on the basis of that and then other neuropsychological testing, you know, looking for the profiles of strengths and weaknesses of, of uh, different parts of the brain because they're specialized in different activities. So we give a battery of tests, you know, trying to get the entire range to see what parts were stronger or weaker and it was none of it. The, the only thing that came out really was uh, was the handedness. Uh, so it was a general brain wasn't formed quite right, uh, oh. but not in any specific place. Okay. It was the overall something went wrong during development. And the reason that that increases a, 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 a non right handedness is one hemisphere develops a couple of weeks ahead of the other. The, uh, uh, the left, left hemisphere, normally the dominant hemisphere, grows faster. But if, uh, uh, and then the other one, you know, catches up over development. But if something goes wrong during development, poor nutrition, maternal stress during pregnancy, you know, something that interferes with the growth of that hemisphere, the other one catches up. Okay. The other one, you know, starts taking over functions that were going to be 
handled by the other hemisphere. And one of those things, one of those functions that switches over turns out to be handedness. So there was something going on. It was mm. during pregnancy. It's purely biological and not inherited. Mm. So it's right. It's gestational. It's in the development of the brain before birth, but there's no gene for it. That's why this doesn't really seem to, the behavior kind of runs in families, if I can say that, but not genetically. It's uh, victims of abuse are more likely statistically to commit abuse, not to be genuine pedophiles. That's not inherited, but the disinhibited behavior tends to go from generation to generation. There's a caveat to that. It's not a like makes like kind of an association, which a lot of psychologists thought for uh, a long time. It's not sexual abuse begets sexual abuse. That's not the pattern. Right. Because it could be physical abuse, you know, non-sexual physical mm. abuse. It could also be neglect. Mm. When those people become parents, sometimes it's sexual abuse, sometimes it's physical abuse, sometimes it's neglect. It's really chaotic childhood begets chaotic parenthood. Mm. But there's no like makes like connection between okay. them, which is what a lot of people thought for, uh, for a long time. So again, it seems to be something stress, nutrition, something that interferes with normal brain growth mm. seems to be the association, but not a gene getting passed from parent to childhood. Okay. So that's why we're seeing handedness, but not, uh, not, a, 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 not necessarily biological parent to biological child. It could be whoever is, you know, parenting, you know, whether an adopted parent, uncles, foster parents, step parents, whoever. Uh, so as I say, it seems to be chaos begets chaos more than anything else. So armed with my smoking gun, the yeah. next set of studies, all right, that was enough to convince the uh, large granting agencies. That's when they started giving me, you know, the real support. And that's when we started doing the, uh, uh, the MRI studies, really taking in this regard. <laughs> It feels funny to think how far uh, back we're going, but yeah, no, we're, we're going back a, a good 15 years now. Uh, and so it was just, I was the first person in my hospital actually to be doing MRI uh, research. We didn't have it, and despite being a big psychiatric hospital, we didn't even have a scanner of our own. I had to bring uh, uh, the, the people volunteering for my study to other hospitals that, that, uh, that did have an MRI in it. Uh, so that's when we started looking at the, uh, uh, at the brain itself. And same thing. I was, you know, so, all right, so what on the surface of the brain, which is usually where all the action uh, is, mm. all right, is there some part that's less healthy, less active, you know, not as, uh, not as uh, well developed? Years, tons of money, lots of effort, all the research assistants, and I had two really, really talented research assistants, you know, and we're chugging through the, uh, through the day, the computers are processing it, and finally we got, you know, usually it's this big, glossy, colorful image highlighting which yep. parts of the brain are different between, you know, your control group and your active group. Nothing. They were identical. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, Luckily, they started legalizing marijuana here in Canada. It was just that it just unbelievable that I, that nothing. But these were really good research assistants. They continued processing the data, even though we finished you know, the gray matter, the surface area okay. of the brain. All those interna all those analyses were done, but they just did you know connective tissue just because there was nothing else to analyze. Ding. Wow. could not, it made no sense. What, what about connective tissue could be, you know, it was the white matter, you know, the, the axons that, you know, remember the, the, we have the cell body of a neuron and then the long axon, which carries the signal to whatever next neuron that it's, uh, it's communicating with. And so the white matter of the brain are just the bundles of those neurons going from, you know, front to back, side to side, uh, and so on. Absolutely made no sense. What about connective tissue? How could that possibly produce pedophilia? It just made no sense to me. I was expecting in some blip in some sex related or attraction related mm. air. Nothing. It was the connective tissue. I just 
could not make heads or tails of it, but I had other work I needed uh, uh, needed to be doing. So I, you know, just started reading through a, a, a other material until all of a sudden, wait a minute. It turns out that the particular areas of the brain that were getting connected, what I was reading was a paper looking at what areas of the brain light up mm. when you show somebody porn, when they see mm. something sexy. Mm. You know, so I, I, again, I was expecting that it would just be, you know, whatever sex center of the brain, you know, controlling hormones deep in the middle lizard brain, we call it. Okay. Thought that would light up. In retrospect, we should have predicted what light, uh, lights up visual areas lit up again in retrospect duh of course mm -hmm. you know they're processing they're really absorbing the porn that they're watching the motor areas of the brain light up because they're imagining moving and you know projecting oh, wow. themselves into the porn that they're what again in retrospect we should have predicted this but the thing that when i saw which areas of the brain were lighting up those areas of the brain are all connected through the white matter connective tissue that I found. These were the same. The particular chunks of the white matter are the white matter pieces that cable together these various parts of the brain that together form not a sex response area, but a sex response network. Hmm. It's each of these areas work together to say sexy, not sexy. Mm. So if there's something almost like a cross wiring, you know, so if there's something not developed correctly, you know, if it's not correctly identifying sexy, not sexy in that network, that's what's producing pedophilia. Wow. The, uh, you know, the parts of the brain, again, basic, basic instincts. Somebody sees a kid, purely unconsciously our voice goes up we make ourselves small <laughs> are you lost can i help you yeah, just natural yeah. you know yeah. instinct you know yeah. I, 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 we just do that without thinking we see somebody attractive again it's an instinct a male our voice automatically gets a little bit lower right. we broaden our stand again just basic human instincts completely uh, subconsciously uh, women when they find uh, see somebody attractive they tend to, you know, posture themselves in a way that accentuates their own curves and hip to waist ratio. They, right. you know, eyes get a little bit more flirty. Again, just basic mm. human built-in social instincts. Mm. It's like the flirtation instinct got cross-wired with the nurturing instinct. Mm. When it perceives a child, head, you know, large in proportion to a body, okay. short and so on, instead of perceiving a kid and triggering the nurturing instincts it's perceiving the kid oh my god and triggering the erotic instincts oh my goodness connect... so all of a sudden there was this now very simple explanation for what made absolutely no sense the, the, the week before wow. and so far that that continues to be that the the going theory is that it, it's almost literally a cross wiring in the social instincts, uh, social instincts of the brain. Okay. A question that I've posed on my social media a number of times in the five years I've been doing this work is, and I've written it in a ver uh, in various ways, uh, depending on how I feel it's going to attract the attention of the audience and help um, encourage them to engage. One of the ways that I have uh, posed this question is, um, is someone born with paedophilia or is it something that makes them that way? So all of your research that you've just beautifully explained there, really interesting, um, is saying that actually it's something in the brain and something that's uh, created from even in the womb. Now, is that going to... So where do we go from there? Because if it's not nurture, if it's not nurture, that means we can't intervene at any stage of someone's life to stop that, uh, whatever's causing it. If it was nurture, we can't we can't intervene in any way. If it's in someone's brain from birth, okay. Let me ask a different question because my mind's firing all over the place here. By the way, so please excuse me just for a moment. So let me ask a, a Great different time question. For an MRI. <laughs> yeah. So so if 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 
it's in someone's brain from birth how is it affecting their behavior before they turn sexual like how is mm. are, are they acting it out in other ways before they turn sexual and and go for it in that way that's an excellent question uh there are two phenomena going on and the problem is in the overlap one is and where a lot of people go wrong pedophilia is not a synonym for child molestation okay pedophilia is the sexual attraction they're into kids the same way the rest of us are into adults mm. that's that they're mm. just they, their body reacts they get you know the same feelings that the rest of us get but they get it when they see a kid mm. that's pedophilia mm. and it's i'll say harmless it's an experience that only they have mm. child molestation is the problem that's what hurts somebody that's the victim if that's what victimizes mm. but these are separate there are pedophiles who molest children there are pedophiles who don't molest children flip side most child molesters are not actually pedophiles most of them actually prefer adult roughly two-thirds wow. are uh, are non pedophiles they're what we call situational offenders they prefer adults they do something often grossly yet uh, inappropriate with the kid you know kind of using them as a surrogate because they don't have wow. you know an adult healthy partner to uh, to interact with uh, that pattern actually is uh, that's the common pattern in incest offenses relatively few incest offenders are genuine pedophiles which are unlike the extra familial uh, mm -hmm. molesters who are much more likely to be genuine pedophiles mm -hmm. so as i say we have two issues going on one is the actual sexual attraction pattern mm -hmm. the other is the willingness to harm somebody that as i said through this kind of you know coming from a difficult chaotic background that one has much more nurture involved in it so a pedophile who actually does molest Ch uh, children we have the pedophilia which okay. seems to be nature but we have willingness to okay. forego other people's well-being which seems to be more uh, mm. uh did i say it right nurture, nurture. Nurture. yeah you got it you, yeah 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 so right so the people who are a danger are the the people who are the most danger are the people for whom it overlaps mm there's not a lot we can do or at least we haven't found any effective way of uh changing a pedophile into a non-pedophile right the best we can do as i say are like with sex drive reducing medications or in some cases if we don't have a, 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 have an alternative actually to take them uh, uh uh remove them from society but the ones who are the real problem are the the child molest it are the child molesters and once they've molested children, whether they're motivated by genuine pedophilia or not, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Or again, for the, especially the psychopaths who just don't care whom they're harming, whom they're harming, if they're not into kids, they're gonna hurt somebody else. It's gonna mm. be a different kind of crime that they commit. Mm. So really it's much more of the psychopathy and antisociality. That's really the problem, but when it's mixed with pedophilia, that's when we get the serial, mm. uh, uh, the serial offenders. So the attraction itself, we don't really have a good way to change. But rehabilitation for you know people with bad behavior in general is rehabilitation for people with bad behavior and antisocial behavior that we need to rein in in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and the side effect is, and the better society gets with preventing chaotic childhoods for anybody, <laughs> the fewer people we will have developing. And again, that's where we get the intergenerational mm. transmission, whether it's molestation or something else. Mm. Uh, the better we can make situations for children in general, mm. then okay. all boats rise in a high tide. Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about um the f uh, the i see that we think of and and this i i feel like you've you've um touched on this a number of times in our conversation so far that actually it would be would you say it would be good for us to understand that there is actually um a spectrum of situations here 
when it comes to people who are either thinking about molesting a child or have molested a child. So at the start of this conversation, you you talked about um, that we have like psychopaths who just don't care and are going to commit the crime and they're going to, if they get caught, they'll do their sentence, they'll come out and they'll commit the crime again. And they're often, um, these uh, these extreme cases are often the ones that we see in the media. So we then paint, we, we then think every offender is of that seriousness. Um, but then we will have offenders that never reoffend again. Maybe they do their prison time and they never reoffend again. And then we, on the other side of the scale, we have people who have paedophilia and they will never offend throughout their whole life because they know that it's wrong. They don't want to. They wish they didn't have this thing in their head. But I think the story that you gave, which is one I'm pretty sure is, which is in the documentary that you feature in, um, where a child of 11 or 12 has a crush on other 11 or 12 year olds and they have boyfriends and they have boyfriends or girlfriends and they get older, but their age of attraction stays the same. So you've got this whole spectrum of people. Now, this is where whenever I said I am trying to uh, encourage at least a discussion on those people that have paedophilia, they know they've got it. They wish they didn't have it, but they have no intention of ever acting on it and committing a crime. Those people are people who we could reach and support to ensure that they never commit the crime. Because there's always going to be a small risk, right? There's always going to be a small risk that at some point in their life, they fall to that temptation. But surely, if we're going to talk about preventing this crime from happening to children, surely th that section of people someone that we could really make some great changes um uh, great great moves forward to ensuring they never commit the crime something like that i feel like that's what the documentary was that that that, that, that you were featured in uh, was about yeah uh I, uh I hesitate to use the word spectrum it, it, in my mind there are clusters I, I i've heard you know i've worked with so many of these people that, you know, in my mind, there seem to be uh, certain stories that I hear over and over and over again. So okay. chunks. Yep. Uh, and I also hear very frequently, you know, of course, you know, email, Twitter, whatever, uh, whatever it is, you know, with Doc, I got a problem or, you know, somebody just saying thank you for understanding. But a lot of the I can't say that I hear from anybody who's teetering because they, they, they tend not to ask questions or come into therapists, they're, they're teetering. What do you mean by that word, For, please? Oh, it, they're tempted. not sure, they, have an, uh, they feel tempted and they have an opportunity to do something inappropriate and they're not sure whether they should go ahead with it okay. or they're not, uh, uh, or they're putting themselves in, the, uh, uh, in harm's way. Mm. Uh, or there are situations that they're, uh, 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 or there are situations that they're in, uh, usually where they're kind of fooling themselves. Okay. Uh, somebody who uh, is talking themselves into believing that, well, this kid is an exception. This kid is precocious. They actually do know what they're doing. Mm, okay. They're fooling themselves. Mm. So the ones who are fooling themselves don't want somebody to set them straight. They're not the ones okay. uh, uh, coming in. But there are also people who I can only describe as desperate. Wow. I mean, these are people, they're never going to have a relationship like the rest of us have relationships. They're not going to have a sexual partner like the rest of us have sexual partners. And no porn, no erotica, no alternative, that, nothing. Wow. Right, which to me, well, we want them to be able to take the edge off. I mean, imagine being a, or rewind to being a, you know, 18 year old mm -hmm. with an 18 year old male sex drive mm. and absolutely no way to direct it. Yeah. Talk about a curse. Yeah. 
Right. So it's when these people are, when we put these people into a desperate situation, they do desperate things. Oh, wow. Right. We want, we want there to be every alternative possible. We want there mm-hmm. to be, you know, escape valve. Is that the metaphor I'm looking for? Oh, we, we, I understand, we want, yeah. We want there to be a way for them to take the edge off, to let some of the pressure uh, out. Now, of course, pornography, you know, the person being photographed in the old days, you know, was mm. a vic- was themselves a, a, a victim. That's out. Well, what about art what about a drawing what about written fiction mm. what about computer generated images mm. there's okay, no okay. victim yeah. we don't have to worry about causing pedophilia because that we now know that that's not how it works understood what about a sex doll designed to look like a kid Mm-mm. and it's not long in the future sex robots mm. It's a lump of latex. There's no, Mm -mm. right. People hesitate and are uncomfortable with the idea. People often think that there's a slippery slope. No. So if you show somebody, you know, uh, gay porn, that's a slippery slope. You're going to turn them into gay. That's, that doesn't happen. That's not how it works. We can't create a pedophile any more than we can therapy somebody out of pedophilia. All we can do is give them, you know, potential alternatives, as I say, to take the edge off. So there's a way to just go home, masturbate, have whatever fantasy they want to have. Mm. Like anybody with, you know, certain kinks that people yeah, yeah. have that, that can't be acted out either. Yeah. Or somebody who's married in a monogamous relationship wants to cheat. Right. Just let the fantasy happen in here because that's that's what it's for right Uh, but people are uncomfortable with the idea because it feels like giving permission yes you know they're now failing to damn you know and they feel like they're aiding and abetting if they don't say this is evil rotten pull out the wood chippers when actually the forbidding the alternatives well yeah i mean directly right i don't like you you want there to be alternatives my immediate brain just doesn't like it because of, because I I'm also like no uh, written written fantasies or or videos or anything like that like computer generated images or even sex doll I'm like no because um, that's kind of um, entitling them to do it and uh, but you but you know then you say to me but surely we want every alternative available to them so that they can release that desire on that. Yeah on that material um, uh, uh, so, before, they so that they desperate. don't go for the real thing. Now, now, now look, two years ago, I actually made a video called Sex Dolls, Child Sex Dolls, Help or Hindrance. And um, I, I gave it my best shot to try to uh, explain both sides of that discussion. I actually re-listened to it the other week and I'm like, oh my goodness, you were articulating yourself so badly, but that's great because that means that I've improved as the years have gone on. And I would, I would carry out that discussion quite differently now um but still that question is really interesting help or hindrance so those other alternatives that you just explained there um written porn computer generated images or videos and child sex dolls or sex dolls that look like children help or hindrance now there's definitely going to be a worry and i'm pretty sure this would be the case in some of the situations that that's going to only excite that person with pedophilia and make them want and make them exercise it and make them want the real thing Uh, that's the argument but there's not a single sexual interest pattern in humans that works that way oh okay you uh usually people say that because it feels like if i give you permission to do it (laughs) it makes me look bad (laughs) because i'm giving you permission because I'm saying the line is here instead of here. Mm. Now, it's not like we've run the experiment. I have every reason, you know, to support the hypothesis that I do, but okay. it's not like we haven't randomly assigned or we haven't, you know, there's no, been no opportunity to look before and after the passage or removal of a law or to compare, you know, rates in one jurisdiction versus another jurisdiction. Yet such a natural experiment has, uh, hasn't happened yet. But as much as uh, people 
very reflexively say it's not worth the risk. No, you're already paying the price. Huh. This is a potential opportunity to stop things. The forbidding of it is, well, that is reasonably hypothesized to be making things worse. And you're foregoing the opportunity to find out that we could be wow. doing better in prevention and you're unwilling to do it. So people are, let's do what we already have a good idea is making things worse wow. and forego the opportunity even to find out if it's better because that one might, what? Keep wow. it the same as where it is now. Mm, mm, mm. So it's not like we're at a place of medium and we're in risking only down. It's we're in the down phase <laughs> and we're not willing to, well, what if the vaccine does work? Mm -mm -mm. It, mm -mm. Right. It's because it makes us feel better because we're expressing our mm. distaste, disgust. You know, we're making ourselves look more virtuous by showing just how bad we can be to the bad guys. Uh, right, right. Oh my goodness, this is throwing me in so many it, it's so it's so tough. It's so pulling at pulling at me in so many different directions because um logically and, and common sense and logic, everything you're saying is is it just makes sense to me personally. I'm going to be so interested to see what people are going to be saying um, when I release this podcast. Um, but it, it, it's so true what you say. It's like, we want to be as bad as we can to the bad guys. And, and that's a great way of putting it. And I mean, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure you but get it. They're not it. bad yet. They haven't done anything. Oh, yet. okay. They yet. haven't For hurt anyone yet. For that section of people. Yes. They're not, bad guys because they haven't done anything yet but but they've got that horrible thing in their head but what you're saying so please help me if uh, correct me if i'm wrong but what what we, what we need to try to get our head around is they haven't committed a crime yet so even though they've just got this they've got this thing in their head that is a misfiring of their brain but they haven't done anything yet Let's work with them to ensure that they never, let's do everything possible to ensure that the crime is never committed. The, the people who are, you know, somewhere, you know, feel more tempted. There are, of course, people who know exactly what's going on and they know to you know, stay out of harm's way, stay out of, uh, stay out of temptation. And, and we have no evidence to suggest that they're failing at that. But there also exist people, you know, with other mental health concerns, people mm. with genuinely low IQs, people mm. who, you know, in general have difficulty uh, 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 managing their own behavior or that uh, can fool themselves more easily or don't have the cognitive capacity to reason for what uh, around what's going on. Uh, imagine uh, to take a relative. It's not very uncommon, actually. Uh, somebody with a very low IQ, somebody with a 70 IQ, 100 is average, you know, but 15 is a standard deviation. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, a person who probably will be at least at least part institutionalized for much of their lives. They just don't have the cognitive capacity to uh, uh, to be entirely independent. Uh, all right. Now, if what if one of those people is attracted to? 12 year olds, mm. somebody with, you know, a mental capacity not far beyond a 12 year old okay. to him. Usually these are almost peers. Mm. They have, you know, similar conversations, similar interests and, you know, the kind of self discipline that it takes, no exceptions, zero. Mm. Right. Somebody okay. in that kind of a situation, we have a much harder yeah. But they literally don't know any better, hmm. or at least it's much harder to ensure that for them to realize it's a much more abstract idea to them than to the rest of us. Hmm. Or, as I say, somebody with you know other mental illnesses that make it you know uh, difficult for them to express in any kind of uh, uh, any kind of self control, and so there is a certain amount of tailoring. Uh, for whatever is appropriate to a given person's uh, uh, situation, and mm. they uh, uh, they range 
wildly. But for you know uh, typical people, again, average IQ, or average functioning, or above average uh, uh, for that matter. Again, it's the uh, a, a way often that I found myself thinking of it when I had to, you know, first go through these same sets of thoughts myself when I was just starting uh, uh, in this field. Uh, really what I was, the conclusion I quickly came to was the realization of how lucky I am. Hmm. I mean, I have the experience, you know, growing up gay in a non-gay world, you know, hmm. that's its own set of difficulties hmm. and just being different from everybody else in a way in the beginning that I couldn't share uh, share with anyone but I'm lucky All right. I, you know, blah, 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 grow up, have an opportunity to, uh, uh, my, it's funny even to say it out loud, my partner and I have been together now 32 years. Hmm. The, the, the words are even hard to come out of. How old can you be? I, I, I thought we were only 32. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so again, I'm lucky. I get to have a happy ending, mm. no pun intended. But these people, <laughs> right, right, they had, they don't get yeah. that yeah. opportunity. So, but what if I was born like that instead mm. of just plain mm. vanilla gay and had a sex drive and nothing to, what would I wish that society did? Yeah. Right. And just good old fashioned, what if it were me? Right. When, when we say, um, uh, when when we mention about like you know we're we're lucky we don't have that. Can you imagine being born with that attraction? Um, can you imagine that as a life like that would be horrendous? A lot of people will respond with oh boohoo because it makes you to to ex to experience that that means you need to experience feeling sorry for them, and that's what that's what people don't like, right? So. And in the social media days, even harder. Okay. People are afraid of, oh, if you're empathetic for them, that makes you suspect. Uh, yeah. mm. Mm. So people, right, mm. worry about their image. They don't want to be associated with it. They just want to show you how bad they can be to the bad guys, therefore oh, how right. good they are. Okay. There's two things I want to ask you. Um, one is going to be for another conversation, which I would love to have with you, James. I found this fascinating sure. and interesting, and I think we have hours. We, we could fill hours. I, I don't know why everybody isn't a sex researcher. What do you mean? Because the stuff is so fascinating. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it's funny that you say that because one of my goals with all of this work is to um, make it, uh, communicate it with content that's actually interesting. And the more that I do this, yes, it's, uh, you know, parts of it are full of sadness, sorrow and darkness. There's many victims and many lives been ripped apart. But when we investigate it from an investi like investigation type of thing, it is interesting. It is interesting from a human nature level. It's interesting. And if we can get interested in it, we're going to talk about it more. We're going to learn more about it. We're going to want to find out more about it. And then hopefully we can move towards some uh, better levels of prevention. Um, so it's I agree with you. The only way to prevent is okay. to uh, any problem is to understand it. It's the right. first step in any of it. Okay. As much as I can appreciate and understand and empathize with the emotion that's not where the solutions are going to come from. Right. We've tried all of that and it just doesn't work. It makes us feel better. It makes uh, us feel, you know, less helpless, but it just doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, that the is, way that, I often uh, describe it, I tell people to tap their inner Vulcan. Okay. Okay. Give me a bit more about that. Like, what does that uh, mean? Uh, as a phrase? Trek, uh, what does uh, that uh, mean? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not a Star Trek watcher. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the question that i'm not going to have time to ask you but i'm going to ask you it because i want to have another conversation is what about people who have made the offense have committed the offense served their prison um time and are now released out into our uh back into our community how do we deal with those but please don't answer that just for the moment please don't answer that now for anybody that is listening comment with the question you would like to ask james 
or comment with a response to any of what James has said, because we are relying on comments because it encourages other people to comment and then we get a discussion going. So please, anybody that's listening, comment in the comment section. Anybody that's watching on YouTube, comment in the comment section. Be brave and put your opinion in there or a question you want to ask James the next time we have a conversation. But I have a final question that I need some help with, please. And that is, how am I to... Uh, what's the correct wording you think I should use? Is this an attraction? Is this a disorder? Is this a misfiring of the brain? How do I label or, or talk about this? What words do I use when we talk about paedophilia? Uh, D, all of the above. Oh, okay. Why? It, it is an attraction. Uh, it, yep. They are genuinely attracted the same way that the rest of us are attracted. Uh, okay. They're just attracted to somebody in a way that they can express without, mm. you know, risking harm to the mm. other. Uh, is it a disorder? It's hard to come up with a definition of disorder that it's not going to fit. Okay. Okay. In and, and that's a philosophical question unto itself, because mm. uh, uh, with uh, uh, mental disorders, we don't have a blood test. We don't mm. have an objective. Mm. There is no way. It, it's versus what? Uh, the best definition I, uh, I've ever read for uh, uh, for uh, a mental disorder is from uh, uh, Jerome uh, Wakefield, uh, who calls it a uh, essentially a, a uh, dysfunction in a mental uh, uh, function, so that it's not doing what it evolved to do. Okay. Okay. And of course, human attraction evolved to facilitate reproduction. Mm. So being attracted to somebody with whom you cannot reproduce because they're not fertile mm. yet fits right. the definition right. of a harmful dysfunction, which right. is, again, that, that's the only objective definition mm. that that, uh, that I can think of. And okay. again, if pedophilia doesn't count as a mental illness, it's right. It, it's hard to imagine that anything would, uh, uh, would count. Uh, and is it uh, misfiring in the brain? Yep, that's what it looks mm. like. It's neurological yeah. and not something that, with today's technology, we you know have any uh, any hope of changing. That's mm. also true. Mm. Uh, now, which of those is relevant? You know, depends on the context and yes. what we're trying to uh, to do. Uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, those aren't either ors. They're all true. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's going to leave me with even more to think about. Um, listen, James, this has been probably the most engrossed I've been in a conversation on my podcast so far because I feel like I'm learning so much I'm finding different ways of looking at things um, I'm going to try to um, uh, get conversations with more people in your in, in doing sex research uh, because I want to bring this topic to my audience if people are interested in finding out more about your work is there a way that they can find you uh, easiest way, I guess, is uh, my own website, which I'm overdue and updating, uh, mm. uh, jamescantor.org. Okay, fantastic. And honestly, if you've got to the end of this conversation and you've been interested by it, you must have been if you got to the end of it, you must go and check out the documentary that I reviewed last week. I'm going to put the link in the description. James, can people view that on Vimeo, like, for free? Uh that's a good question. Because I know it, you sent uh, me the link to it, but I don't know whether that was like an access link. It it was accessible from, it was produced by the CBC, mm. the, uh, the Canadian BBC. Uh, but uh, I think the however many years when, uh, went on, I don't know if it's still on their servers. I don't know that for uh, for sure. I have to go send an email to the uh, to the guy who produced it. Okay, no problem. Well, we will do we will do a bit of investigation in that, and I will put a link, even if it's just to my YouTube video reviewing that documentary, because it is at the very least thought provoking. So I found it really interesting. So James, thank you so so much. We will have another conversation, and good luck with all of your work, and stay connected. My pleasure. Thank you very much. We're moving forward. <laughs>